that video can mean only one thing. We're adding another head geek. Please welcome our newest head geek, Sasha Giza. Welcome, welcome to the team. Hi, thank you. It is great to have you. Uh, let's do the honors as our former newest head geek, Destiny. I would love to. Destiny, you're graduating. I know, I'm so excited. I finally grew up and graduated. <laughs> yeah, now we got somebody new to clean the server room. That is right. <laughs> That's right. And so Sasha joins us actually from our European headquarters in Cork, Ireland. Where I started more than four years ago. Right, and that's what the accent I recognize. That's yeah, what I guess. It's totally yeah. Irish. It's a little bit of that and a little bit of German. Oh, but just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Sasha's been with Silowinds for almost five years now. He's worked with lots and lots of you, especially in Europe on the phone, and uh, we are just thrilled to have you. Thank you. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to actually see you. Where are you going to be uh, first? Oh, my first appointment would be in Dubai at the Jitex in October, I think 40 to 18. And don't forget, you'll be with me, VMworld Barcelona. That's the 5th through 8th in November. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be with me at the SWUG in London, November 13th, and the SWUG in Frankfurt, November 15th. So basically, we all just get to fly around and go to Europe and visit Sasha. Yes. So yeah. That's what I got. Is that, is that a bad plan? Yeah, I mean, that was the whole point. Guys, and we were going to guys sorry. Um, for me, as a German, it's important that things are in order, okay? And I think we are in a lab episode right now, aren't we? Oh. oh. Shame on you. Welcome to SolarWinds Lab, and today we're diving into something you've been asking us to spend a little more time on, mapping. And in particular, how to do mapping automatically. Joining me today are a couple other head geeks, Thomas LaRock and Patrick Hubbard. Well, I was in the area and I already have the lab coat, so. Yeah, but you don't have to wear your lab coat at Thwack Camp, and that's coming up in a couple of weeks. It's true, but this year they are going to make me wear pants. Okay, yeah, well, Thwack Camp will be fun, so make sure you register now, especially if you like Thwack Points. We'll throw in a link. Yeah, it's thwackcamp.com. But yeah, I mean, you've been in, talking to us for a, a long, long time, like at Cisco Live and other events, and have asked us over and over again to show you some of the advanced features that you might not know about, but maybe they've been in the products that you're using for a really long time. Right, and I spend most of my time working with databases and virtualization, and even if you limit maps just to those two, it's, it's still helpful, but I really wanted to be part of the session so I could learn more about the mapping feature for the other products. Ah, but we're not going to limit to just that. Network maps, application maps, virtualization map, cloud maps, mm, they want to know about mapping, as in how many things can we get maps automatically? Okay, so if you're going to show network mapping and I'm going to do mapping for apps and virtualization, then Patrick is talking about... Cloud, sort of. I mean, don't really think of it as cloud. More sort of how do I map things with lots of moving pieces, sort of distributed applications. And that's things like uh, tracing and uh, some of the other tools that maybe you're familiar with, like app optics, but you know how to use them in collaboration with the Orion platform and a couple of other things. And, and we'll, I'll take a couple of minutes. We'll talk about that at the very end. And you know I'm all about automating network maps. It's just so handy, and I'm always on board with tracking down and proving it's always the application and never the network. Now, that is not true. Well, except when it is true. Well, we're about to find out. So why don't we start where everyone always seems to, the network. It's the network. I beg to differ, and I think I can prove it. I know you came here for a how to do network maps. Let's start by talking about some of the new mapping features you might not know you already have. Okay, so when we're talking about mapping, I've I always loved looking at the NetPath itself, actually. I never get tired of looking at NetPath. It's amazing being able to figure out mapping, essentially mapping the internet, or at least the part that maps to a path, really, really helpful. Of course, what I think you like the most is network maps. Definitely. Being able to visualize where the network traffic is going and being able to pinpoint into it and event correlate, that's something that I actually find fun. Well, and what I love is it's also an inven it's inventory for me, right? Because it's basically yeah. taking all the goodness that makes AppStack work and pulls it up here so that I can, I can, I can quickly navigate. But before we dive into screens, let's don't do that just yet. And I promise we are going to we are going to spend all this episode doing how-tos on how to how to use these these features. But let's let's take a minute and just talk about mapping, the sort of the fundamentals of mapping and why do we care? So why do we care? So me it's visualization the first alerting. So I like to be able to know what is connected on the infrastructure. If I'm going to help build a better network or to even try to have things be more secure, I need to know what is relying on my network and what is what is going on. So I need to know all the pathways that's happening. Absolutely. And so for me, what I love about the map is the visualization again 
first of all, just being a data person, loving the idea that you can visualize your data. If you can't visualize your data, you're probably not collecting the right data. So for us to have that and to see the related entities, because somebody's always trying to blame a database, and that poor database has done nothing wrong, and these maps help me understand everything that's related, and that way I can track down that root cause much faster. Well, I think what I like about it is, I admit that I don't know how everything is connected. You can't. It's yeah. a, an incredibly long tail. There's the things that you work with over and over and over again, and then there's a whole lot of things that can break where you're doing root, ca root cause troubleshooting. And being able to figure out what those are, you're spending so much of your time just trying to figure out not just how things are connected. Like at this case, it, on this, at this layer, like where it's sort of the first couple OSI layers, well, that's easy. Something is plugged into a thing, or it's configured and it's bound to a port, or it's attached to a Mac, or it's hooked to an IP address. But especially when you get into application mapping or how uh, VMs are connected or something else like that, well, that's not something that maybe we always know. And so you need to be able to essentially walk in real time dynamically into things that you've never seen before because it's your guide into the unknown. Well, and for me, I think, especially with the network layer itself, when everybody is out there creating applications and they're creating DevOps, right? Like everybody's trying to get the information which that they're going through there. I don't know every tool that everybody's using because there's free tools that are out there. There's things that are on the network that I wasn't prepared to actually create for, right? And so a lot of the times when we're looking at the mapping and I'm seeing the traffic and then I go a step further when I start to analyze it and look at NetFlow data, things like that, I'm like, what is this? Like, how can I see this? So being able to stay up to date with the traffic and the flowing of how things are being used helps me to mitigate and as well as troubleshoot quickly to figure out where I need to do or if I need to apply any new policies, any QoS, anything of that nature to make sure that everything has the vital necessary bandwidth that it needs. Well, I think you, you hit on an interesting point there, which is it's not so much about the maps themselves. Visio is an amazing tool, and you can create beautiful maps in Visio. and in fact, you can throw them uh, into the background in a, a regular Orion map, and they look great. Add your objects on top of it, add applications, that is really, really cool. But when you're really talking about mapping, sort of at a fundamental level, is we're really talking about interconnections and how things are connected to get to the point that things are maybe dynamically mapped so that you don't have to draw everything by hand. So it's sort of a different way of thinking about going beyond what you see visually in any interface, but like how the data is connected, because that's really the magic of maps, because it's following the way our minds work, it's following the way the applications work. So sort of learning to think about maps not so much as, as an art project, or a visual design project, but more an information relationship uh, project. And then this just ends up being sort of the visualization layer on top of that. And I, I would add, uh, in the world of data and databases, where you're getting your data from today, like back in the day, you had an idea, it was there, there, and that's about it. These days, it can come from anywhere, right? Some dev or some business user just decides to connect to the database and they weren't there just yesterday. Just this one time. Just this one time. And so data comes in, data goes out with the mapping. This is all data that we're already collecting, right? It's not anything you know special or new. We, we've already had this data, but we're just putting it to these maps. So now I can go in and say, you know what? At that moment in time, this five or 10 minute window, I can see where that database server is being touched or touching all these other entities. And it helps people to reinforce the complexities of you know, their data environment, to understand how much is coming in and going out. I think from a security side, one of the points that I like with the mapping and that helps me trace things out and to go through there is that services are making calls with applications that maybe even the application owner doesn't know. Like maybe I'm going to go out and I need to do an address lookup or maybe I'm going over here and doing a credit card transaction. I need to know this for my ACLs. I need to know what the proxy, where we're going with this, what, what needs to be allowed, what needs to be normal, what is not normal, what's the exception, but I don't know that until I have some kind of a visualization of actual represented um, data. Yeah, maybe you also just don't like getting yelled at because we always end up, you know, sort of, uh, and that's not IT flows downhill, but uh, is, is it, how many times do we end up uh, responding to events on systems that really we don't have any real authority over? To exactly. your example, that, yeah. that one lookup, but it's going to run for three years, teams are going to change, and somehow you have to be able to uh, find it to troubleshoot, but also maybe just document it. Like all of a sudden you got, hey, we, we actually have a compliance issue here. We need to show what all the interdependencies in our relationships are. Mapping is a great way to do that because it lets people maybe who aren't as technical or they don't tend to think of like, well, I know everything in this subnet is somehow related, I'll figure it out. Those visual representations really make it easier to answer questions in a way that make maybe less technical management feel a lot better that you have it under control. I mean, it's the same reason why if you still got, what, a plotter 
every now and then, create a big, beautiful, complicated diagram, run it off in the plotter and stick it up on the wall. And as leadership walks by, they're like, wow, our team has just got this under control. <laughs> Except that everything changed the minute it was posted. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so then let's kind of dive in and, and touch on these points and show like how we can represent this. And let's start off with the network. Okay, so here is a network map. Now, how I got this is based upon, I went to a node and on the left hand side, you guys may not know this is even here, but this is one of the, the options available now is mapping. And so when you click onto that, depending upon the type of node that you're in, it'll take you to its network map layout or its design technology layout, the which that's there, which you guys will cover in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when I'm here, if I click off of it by accident, a lot of you have told us that you've done this, you can click onto the node to pinpoint all the connections and bring the sidebar back. Right, so the sidebar, again, is whatever is sort of gray highlighted here. Everything that's listed in the sidebar are the things that we know about it. So like in this case, I've got the um, physical port list. I can actually see like the uh, physical hardware sensors maybe that are part of that that are reporting. And then I can see things like, I think these are IPSLA operations that are assigned to those. And um, I can see my logical uh, ports as well. So go to something more exciting, this database server, where those entities show us everything that would be associated with that. So we can also put the drilling in, and this is from your SQL application itself, the overall hardware status on the box, as well as you can see here your interface volumes, things that are which that are connected to there. But on this one, when we go back in here, I want to focus on the network because obviously, me. <laughs> but, um, so. Obviously everybody. Because, right? because, you know, that's what the problem is. is exactly. The no, no, it's not. It's not <laughs> so when we go through here, you can see that it's actually showing you kind of what a lot of people have asked for weather mapping. So when people say weather mapping, it's not the actual weather mapping. But with, with us talking with the THWAC community, they're like, I need to know how is the flow going through here? Am okay. I having a problem with the tra transmitted or the received? Is there something that's going on with this connection? Do I have it you know, in full duplex? Does it have to play? Like, there's right. a lot of questions that get answered that a map visually. Nothing ever goes wrong with a port, ever. No, never. Yeah. And nobody accidentally shuts it off when they're playing around with monitoring tools, right? No. Had that happen. So, when we're showing this here, you see the red here, obviously. Now, when I hover over this, it's telling you that this is going to be the error and the discards. Right. If you notice right below it, it says traffic utilization. So we understand that at the moment, you guys are concerned about the traffic utilization, but based upon alerting and thresholds that we know, if there's a event correlated issue that's actually happening here, we will put the alert here. So that's how okay. you're getting the error and discards because we're like, hey, the traffic utilization, we have that information as well, but we really think you should see that this is spiked up and that this is a problem here. So one thing that's a little bit different here, like, I mean, I, I did make the little joke earlier about NetPath, but NetPath is different in that it's mm -hmm. automatically creating all of the dynamic thresholds for what is what is green, yellow, or red. Yeah. But in this case, you're saying that if there's something that's coming up red, like because this is a network view here, in this case, this errors and discards, that is something that would be hitting the threshold mm -hmm. based on this element. Now, you might not have an alert actually defined for that. I mean. It depends. If this is really sensitive, probably you would, or maybe this is extra noisy, you don't need, so you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But that way you can at least know, if I have an alert defined on this threshold, if it's red, I would be getting an alert. Yes, and actually when we were talking about in one of our THWAP camp sessions that's coming up, is optimizing Orion, and within the, the settings for the polling settings, you can change those thresholds. So if you don't have alerts, that's where you would look why that would be alerting, because you yeah. have thresholds that would be set there. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing about these views that, that I personally like is when I'm troubleshooting a problem, you gotta pinpoint it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we obviously know we're starting with this node. I'm going to click in to this transaction, right? Like I'm looking at the connections between, between these that are happening. On the right, you're going to notice it is going to pinpoint us down into just these two locations. So I can see which ports are available, which devices are on there, and then I can visually see, okay, this is the one that's having the problem. It's at 14.4K inbound, not outbound, errors and discards of which that are happening across there, right? right. So this automatically okay. pinpoints my focus on the entities of which that I am monitoring and where I should be looking for this. Hmm. So it's also going to be context-based, right? So you sort of think of click on the thing to get its relationships. So before, when we were clicked on this node here, 
right? On the sidebar, we saw all of the things that were related, were the four things it was physically connected mm -hmm. to. If we actually come into the link here, it's just going to be narrowed down. So in a way, these are kind of like drill in, auto click down like anything else. And that's the way that I typically walk context is that I'll go and look at this and say, okay, well, what is the port? Well, they're not listed in the map, but here's the physical ports over here. So if I click on a port, then I'm going to get all of its relationships. Definitely. And then also if we click into that device itself, you're going to see all the ones that are associated with it pertinent to the ports and the transactions, the voice over IP op operations, everything across there. Oh, and look, there's an application. That's, uh, so this one, I guess, is probably coming out of WPM, and it's suffering a transaction latency that's having something to do with these errors of discard. Right. And so when we drill into that to see, since we knew that it was coming from that device, all the other entities that we are monitoring will show up on the right hand side. So I'm already troubleshooting and like you were saying, you're like, oh, look, there's a problem that's going on here. These are probably related. Now I can go to like say network configuration manager or something and I can like see what's going on, drill more into it or make a change that was happening there. So before this map existed, how, was, how would somebody have you know, discovered these re, uh, relationships between these entities in order to troubleshoot. Because what you're showing me is fabulous. You're, you're right down to the specific um, device and the port and all that. How would you have done that before this map? Oh, we're going to get into, well, now you were doing enough with unstructured data to think about grids, right? Yeah. So grid data, not, I can have things that are associated with different objects and then it sort of spiders out and I can come into any part of that grid map and then walk, right? Yeah. Well, when you think about, I mean, and, and you've been working with, for those of you who've been working with the Orion platform for a long time, you're used to sonar. Once upon a time, that was pretty much just, you know, sort of IP sweeps. Now it's doing nearest neighbor and it's doing a whole bunch of other protocols. And so all of that data as it's collected is sitting and has been sitting for a very long time inside the Orion database, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, that kind of context happened during the discovery. So to your, to your, to the answer to your question was, how did we do it in the old days as admins? You know, you did this with databases. You'd go draw the diagrams and you might log into uh, the uh, configuration on a router or a switch and you'd look and then you'd look at the application definition and then you'd collect it all and you would draw it. And to your point earlier, it would be exactly as fresh and accurate as when you hit print. Right, we would trace and say, uh, look for host names, IP addresses, client IP addresses. Little Wireshark. Little Wireshark maybe, uh, you know, it's a little advanced for most DBAs, I guess. But yeah, you know, uh, little networking tools in order to figure out all the activity that's happening. Or, uh, what I want to get to is, you start writing queries against the monitoring database to build a view to mm -hmm. say, all right, tell me who was doing what with this entity. And, but with the map, what you're doing right here, it's point and click, and it's like, oh, let me go to this thing, oh, and let me go to this thing, oh, and now it's over here, and that gets you three and four levels left, right, however right. you want to say it, faster than any other way you're ever going to get there. Well, I was going to say, the funny thing is, many of you have been actually using this for years and you didn't know it, because Network Atlas Maps, you know when you go and you create the map and then there's the Connect Now button? Yeah. That's doing exactly what this is in terms of logically connecting those objects. And here, it's now just dynamic and it's being rendered as a part of that control. And, and something as a networker, what would happen before when this would happen? Like, mm -hmm. in, in you're saying that it was an application problem, like, as we can see from WPM, the Web Performance mm -hmm. Monitor, is that a user is probably having slow right now. Oh, I'm guessing. So I'm getting a phone call, mm -hmm. you know, saying the network's down. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not working. I'm trying to go here and it's not happening. Or you're looking at your page abandon rates. Right. Right. The marketing team is upset because all of a sudden their cross, their uh, kind of upsell off of people who are browsing the site or, is going down. Or you're getting that phone call and they're saying something and you have a long list of things that could be the possible issue. And then that's the list that you're literally multi-threading your department yeah. for. I'm saying, okay, you take over the database side, see if there's something going on in there. And it's like, you take care of, you know, write your awesome queries and see if you can come up with a tool that can help us figure this out better, right, for the meantime. And then for me, myself, I'm sitting here going to each device that I know could, might, you know, be a part along the chain mm -hmm. of where they're going and I'm running show commands. I'm trying to get, you know, I'm sitting, I'm using Wireshark, I'm using things like that and I'm using all of these tools to try to get some idea of where something might happen. Here, I'm visually clicking in, I'm going down the layers, I'm seeing only the entities of which that are resulting to these devices. I'm pinpointing it in, and then, if I'm wanting to look at these, I can drill into this device, the actual interface, because I'm saying, hey, this is the one that's having the problems. And the great thing that I like about it 
is no longer am I still going to the device. I'm just in this one tool. I'm scrolling down here, and I'm like, I'm automatically looking at that interface config. Because mm -hmm. before I was doing that, I was going to the device. I had to get the show commands. And then, or if I was using configurations, I was looking through it, you know, word find, right? Like, I'm like, find this, find this, find mm -hmm. this, so I can figure out what's going on. By having this tool and being able to pinpoint it in and drill into here, I'm already troubleshooting as I'm looking. I already know what's involved. And then when I want to go into the device, I can look at the interface, the config for it only. This is huge for me. Yeah. I mean, as a networker, That's this is because you like, actually care about how, how uh, ACLs are configured. Right? So I'm like, I'm so excited that I'm care. able to just drill into here and be able to see the interface config because it, it saves me time. I've already saved time yeah. by pinpointing it, and I'm saving more time because I'm not wasting everybody else's time to tell them to go look at things and try to drill into it. I'm visually looking here, seeing the duplex, seeing everything that's coming across here, verifying the health because I knew exactly where to go to. Yep. But hey. what if, oh, well, I was going to say, what, what if you were, okay, let's say you're a, da you're a database admin, or uh, as many of us end up okay. being accidental DBAs. Accidental DBAs. Right? So you are not a networking guru. And so you believe. I can spell network. Yeah, and you believe. So proud. You, you, you believe that the way that applications work best is if the pipes are as wide open as possible, right? And only for data traffic. And only for, well, okay, but, oh, I like where you're going with this. I can do that. Exactly. <laughs> I like where you're going with that. But so let's say you see an issue. You're looking at a map. You start sort of from the application perspective. And we're going to actually show you this here in just a second. But you start kind of from that application perspective. You normally wouldn't go to the network because you wouldn't be able to pull the config. You wouldn't look no, at right. traffic shaping rules. Rules, uh, capturing classes, anything else, or to your point, like sort of uh, optimization and maybe uh, QoS to uh, accelerate database. I could track. do a ping or a trace route in order for me to understand, you know, latency between two points. Right, that'd but, be the extent of it. Exactly. But let's say you are a DBA and you're looking at the relationships in the application map. Well, if you click on the physical network that's underlying that application, all of a sudden I can send this as a uh, link or a screenshot or whatever else, or throw it in, in uh, Slack to the networking team. That's right. And they know what to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So do you want to talk just briefly about, is there anything in particular that we need to do uh, for discovery to make discovery more effective? Because again, the power of this is based on what it knows about on the networking side, how they're related. And I, I suppose this, this is also a general tips and tricks recommendation for the way that discovery always ought to be done for automated uh, uh, de dependency mapping, um, uh, alert suppression, a lot of other things. So is, are there anything that they ought to make sure that they take care of as a part of that initial discovery to make sure that the database is really populated with rich uh, with rich data. So uh, what I would suggest is that when you add in your nodes and you're adding your interfaces that's within there, there is a layer two and a layer three that it will actually grab the information from in your list resources. Now when you're doing this, I always suggest that you click those because it's, as I always tell people with NetFlow, right? Like NetFlow is layer three slash four information, but you miss layer two information. So a lot of times people wonder why the bandwidth is off from the NetFlow data, and it's because it's not seeing layer two traffic. And the more complex environments there are, the you know, you're not seeing everything that's it, on it's there. It's only seeing what NetFlow is reporting, right. not the actual counters that are part of those interfaces. Exactly. So what I like to tell people is like, especially with your mapping, to make sure you're catching everything that's connected. And if it's not going through NetFlow, that you need to or not producing NetFlow. Okay. Then make sure you have that layer two and that layer three routing that's actually being checked in your list resources when you're adding those devices in when you're doing your discovery. I always like to make sure that my rediscovery mm. is on and those it's set by default for 30 minutes, right? And so depending upon how big your network is and how much load balancing that you're using with additional pullers or the scalability engines, that is also going to determine that number, which we talk about also, you know, in, in other labs as well. But you know, you because you got to think of the database guy, right? Like, don't, don't make him crazy. Think, think of the database guy. Right. Nobody ever thinks. Of but this. we need to make sure that, for me, my my one big tip and trick that I can say is network standardization. I would say that is mm -hmm. also vital because yes. as soon as you know what the naming schema is on the devices, that can also help you locate, understand, and know what's going on with the device without even trying to think about it. Naming conventions? No, we should name things after Smurfs. I think yeah. that, yeah, that doesn't work so well. So, so oh, okay, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, but another reason I really like your recommendation to regularly rediscover, and in fact, I know it seems expensive, but occasionally 
global rediscovery, like rediscover everything, and you can set the interval on that. You don't have to do that every night. But the other thing is, when you look at the increase in capability of the discovery engine itself, from release to release, every time you upgrade, you're going to often get additional increases in the richness of that discovery data. Good so point. by rerunning discovery, you will see things start to snap together that otherwise wouldn't if you don't go and rediscover them every now and then. So that's another good reason to do that too. I, I, I think, and you've touched upon it, but the point I want to hammer home really is that this is data we're already collecting mm -hmm. or have the ability to collect. And have been for a long and, time. And have been for a long time. And we're just now starting to get these into visualizations for everybody. So a rediscovery, things like, like the structure's already there. I mean, we're already collecting this data, but now we're able to, I'll say, make it more magical. Well, and, we're, and we're, I was going to say, we're about to start talking about application mm -hmm. uh, mapping as well. But before, do we want to give a shout out to those who are helping the UX team? Because, Definitely. Because, sure. because the Usability Buddy program, uh, mm -hmm. first, is a chance to get as many flat points as actually doing like a beta. Yep. But when you look at this, this is again, you know, you, whether it was Thwack Camp last year, we talked about some of the some of the things that were coming along down the down the, the pike from for the Orion platform. These are a lot of these things, especially when it comes to visualization. You are incredibly helpful. Your comments in Thwack are great, and especially working with the UX team, you're looking at literally what you've been asking for because you're helping us do that. Definitely. How about we get started more towards the applications? We can do that. Okay. Well, if we're going to do that, i got to drive. So. Okay. All right, so this is an application map, and this is the world's most simple application map for Exchange, right? So we got two servers over here. I've got my okay. uh, East server, and I can see all of its attributes because, again, these are all the things that we know about it. And mm -hmm. I can see services, a mailbox, sort of some of that uh, like uh, App Insight view because mm -hmm. this is an App Insight monitor. Um, now, I don't necessarily want to show the map with all the mailboxes. I probably don't want to do that. But uh, I've got another server over here, which is my West. And if you think about what's going on here, this is a regular um, sort of clustered set of Exchange servers. Now, they're running in uh, VMs, so they really don't know all that much about themselves, about how they're related uh, physically. They just know that they, they know about each other, but they don't really know much else. And I know you probably have an opinion on that. And Well, you mentioned virtualization, so I'm curious. All right. Well, I'm, I think you want to talk about this a little bit here in a second. But the thing to look at here is that, um, Everything seems to be green, right? I don't have any process issues down no. here on this server. Yeah, and I can good. really quickly look at it this time and I can say, well, I do have an alert on this Exchange instance. Okay, where's that coming from? But my ports and everything else, the services that are running on the system seem to be okay too. Yeah. But again, as Destiny was saying before, where normally I would get information about the connection, in this case, because I have something that would qualify for an alert that's being surfaced and applied to the top here in red, I've got a lot of latency there. Okay, so the question is, where is that coming from? Well, you it's not the network. It's not the network. Well, what else is that 88 milliseconds saying? See, I think Tom's point is, well, where is it occurring if it's not occurring on the network? That See, doesn't mean... Question. Let's get to the prove it part. But that doesn't mean it's the network's fault, right? Oh, I didn't say that. Okay. Okay, I did. You did say that. So I'm going to click on, guess what, 88 milliseconds. And so yeah. now I can actually see the relationships between those two again. Because right. right, we so it's not the context of East or the West server, it's how are they connected. Yep. And so if I look over here on the right now, I've got something a little bit different, right? These mm -hmm. are actually the application connections. And oh look, there's my 88 milliseconds. Now yeah. both of these nodes are green because those nodes are okay. But if I drill into this, I can actually see the traffic mapping between these two. Okay. So this is coming from when you install the agent. Like, um, if for those of you who've clicked on the up under start quality of uh, quality of experience, mm -hmm. right? Being able to actually sample it samples the traffic or not samples the traffic. It's watching the traffic. It's, mm -hmm. it's that uh, little shim driver that installs as a part of the uh, traffic analysis agent. I can actually now correlate where all of those uh, c those conversations are. So in this case, here's east and west. I can see the two servers on both sides of that conversation because remember, when I clicked on the center of that, it's telling me how they're related. Mm -hmm. So the related elements here, and here I can actually see all my traffic going in this case from west to east. I can see the ports that it's flowing over. I can see also the executables, or at least the services that are uh, exposing those ports and that are running that traffic. And here I can see my 88 milliseconds, and I can see which applications are actually red. So now I know you've been trying to blame the network the whole time, but let's just assume it's not the network and it's the application. So it's the application, right? No. No, it's not the application because an application is a victim of 
the network. The, the, <laughs> the resources that it sits on, right. right? Especially if it's virtualized. So yep. when applications have problems, generally it's going to be about resource consumption. It's going to be about memory or CPU, or it's going to be about storage or IOPS or something else, right? That's right. So in this case, using the map, and I'm essentially walking through the map, I went from two objects or two services or two servers that were related by, uh, in this case, the traffic, where mm -hmm. they're flowing between them, that don't really know too much about how they're topographically connected in terms of which one is in which VM host and the rest of it. But now I can take this down and say, oh, I've got an exchange source service issue. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to drill into that service. So uh, before you get there, well, I, I just noticed this 88 milliseconds was on that original graph, mm -hmm. right? And I was wondering about, because there's only one alert there, but what I've noticed is that this is the summary. 88 is the sum total, 70 is the bulk of it. Now this two milliseconds you know, might be a warning because it's a yell and all that, but obviously this is the thing that we want to focus on. So what I really liked was basically that, say, hierarchy. Like I know 88 isn't, like you said, this really isn't the issue service host to here. Although a traditional tool might just be showing you that, like the total sum latency. Right. We're giving you granularity into understanding all this, because you might have to come back later and deal with these yellows for like a secondary oh, issue. Oh, you are. Yeah, but right now we can focus on that red one to get started because, uh, or the store service, because we know that's the bulk of that 88. This is, this is brilliant. For a data person, I can't tell you how much I'm just loving all of this structure and summary and granularity and so helping you can me drill through. Blame it on the application owner so, of the yeah, network. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anything but the database. So, oh, sorry. Uh, well, for me, like coming into here and drilling into this to see what's going on when I when I get the phone call, this helps me out to be like, okay, now I understand the tra kind of traffic and the flow of what's being used behind that. So then I can look at if there's any QoS policies or anything that may be there, an ACL that may have been done, look for anything that's changed, because that's what's always happened, what's changed. Exactly. So that's what I can start looking for while you guys are more, you know, focus point and drilling into it. Well, and there's another thing that I use this, these sorts of views for too, is a lot of times when you look at something, you'll actually see the events that are correlated alongside that's actually raised by that. And I know we have done, if you have not noticed that we have done a million episodes on how to minimize the number of alerts that you are getting, go back to lab.solarwinds.com, <laughs> look at our archives, because if you are getting alerted to death, they are not working for you. Yeah, but a lot of times there are amazing events raised that I don't see, that I don't have an alert on, and maybe I don't really care about most of the time until I'm solving it. So again, this sort of using mapping to then correlate to extra events, like here on the right-hand side, here's all of my events that are related to these. So did one of these raise an alert? Could it have or should it have? Maybe this is a candidate for one that I actually want to raise an alert on. Mm. A lot of times I'll use that as well, so I don't really have to know until I need to know. So I, I use it kind of as a Google for looking up events that are related to the things I'm trying to troubleshoot. Do you want to... Yes. I know I sort of challenged just, you. Just yes, just so drill. You, I'm waiting for you to drill. Let's go. You want to talk about virtualization? We can talk about virtualization. All right, let's do that. Let's okay. put you over here. All right. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is a mapping specific to virtualization. Now, I already said you couldn't do that. Yeah, you said you, we couldn't do that, even though you had the two clusters and there was a line between them. That's okay. So, but what I want, I want to do here is I want to take a moment to just show the power of, again, the data that we're collecting and the mapping we have. Okay. And so we can see all the related entities. So what we'll do is we'll start, uh, I am focused on this Hyper-V cluster right here, right? So I clicked, now I can see all of the guests that are immediately tied to that particular host, okay. right? That's all these entities over here, and I can filter, we can show, I could look at different uh, metrics over here, right? I could look at hardware categories or interface volume, virtual machine, or just the full list. I've got 57 things to look at here. Uh, there's only one particular alert, Web02, uh, which seems to have a problem, so that guest on this host seems to be an issue. So that's an application that's having a problem with the database that's running on a VM on this no, host, maybe. We Maybe, we don't know. We just know that there's something bubbling to the top for that VM guest. Got it. If I'm curious about it, I might want to drill into it, but I'm not curious about it because it says Web02 and not SQL. So we're going to look <laughs> at this one that says SQL. I'm going to click on this, and I'm going to get an idea of what is running there. It looks like, that, looks like it's Linux, and my SQL happens to be running. Okay. Now, you know, I'm not afraid of the letters SQL, even if there's an MY in front of it. So, <laughs> no, it's uh, yours. You own it. It's mine. Yeah, it's, 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 that's how that works. But I can get an idea of, again, the entities related to this, and I can, now I can walk something, right? And I can see that Web01 tied to my SQL, and now I've got this thing way out there. 
that's just some rogue. I'm sure that's some dev that's just loaded something under his, okay. his in his cube. It's just running. He gave it some garbage name, and he's just trying to you know get the job done for the day. That but, never happens, right? And now in between those two seems to be the issue. And then again, I can click like you were showing before and drill down. But back to this guy, again, the power of understanding what now I can go and say, well, what's really happening here? Now, let's, if there was an issue, the power of me being able to click and then come to say, let's look at the application details. And now there's nothing wrong necessarily here, but I get a lot of information about what's happening for that particular database engine. Well, there and, is, yeah. And you know we're seeing at the cluster level, right? So the app looks okay, but something else is going on. There's something else going on here. There's this particular, there's a warning. Let's click and see what's happening. Memory. Back to that cluster, running VM, CPU. Again, walking through to get an understanding of where that bottleneck really is, what's right. happening here. It looks like I, uh, I have two hosts clustered together. And look at that, you know, memory use is 93%. Mm -hmm. That may be a little too high. I, I certainly don't have a lot of room for growth if an event happens on one or the other, right? Uh, I'm concerned or curious to know why 93% is used on A, but only 77 is on B. Mm -hmm. Seems like that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense right now, but being database servers, I believe, tied to this, so. Well, but you were probably also getting a recommendation that was suggesting that you move something on yeah, that. Yeah, so that's one of the great things about the virtual, about vMan in general, is that recommendation. I could, this could be tied to a recommendation all the way back where I would want to say, hey, tell me more about, uh, or it would prompt me to say, by the way, you know you're having an issue here and we recommend that you do this. So, so wait a minute, VM, vMan is going to actually show you and give you recommendations kind of like DPA, DPA does? It absolutely does. It does. And one of the things, though, about it that's interesting for me is that let, I'm a casual vMotioner, right? Mm -hmm. I will use it on occasion, but especially like it, like our shared mm -hmm. environment that we have for lab, right? Right. We stay in pretty good communication on Slack. We're, we're chatting. But the point of that recommendation is I ought to just be able to do it. But I use mapping a lot of the time to just verify that that's OK. Because my gut says, you're recommending that I move this, this VM from this host to another host. I would assume that that recommendation includes some knowledge of the fact that they are at least maybe in the same cluster, mm -hmm. and that one of them is not on the East Coast and one of them is on the West Coast. But if I am casually making those changes, I use mappings a lot of time to make sure that that makes sense, that, that, might, that moving that VM is not going to move it suddenly into a different cluster somewhere else where I'm going to incur even more latency at the expense of improving or optimizing memory. And that brings me to the point of like switch stacks, right? Like that's with the full redundancy versus half redundancy. Mm -hmm. That visualization that we have on switch stacks, that can make a big difference if you're moving different please, pe people around to different buildings as well. Because if it's not in full duplex and you think that you have the redundancy there, you're going you're gonna to be missing it and it's going to be put, putting you down on some downtime. And so you asked about recommendations. Here's mm -hmm. a big list and right at the top, memory utilization for this particular host, reach a critical threshold, and they suggest moving some VMs around. If you notice back on that other screen, we are running 10 out of 10 running VMs, 10 out of 11 there. So I've lost all my headroom. The reason that B has extra is because of the way they've probably been sized. But you know, again, I'm curious about this. Why are 10 and 11? Like, what's going on? Because to me, the cluster, they should be identical servers. Right. Uh, pretty close to identical. If I've got 11 on one and 10 on the other, did somebody move something? But then there's a recommendation saying, by the way, you might want to move. And there could be a recommendation saying there's something wrong with A. Uh, that wasn't at the top of the list. It was a different, happened to be a different server. But I wanted to make sure you could see that. We'll make that recommendation. We'll say, you know what? You're kind of overloaded on this particular one. You should move it. Also, uh, getting to root cause, just through the map, drilling through. Of course, there's performance analyzer as well. Click. Brings me right to perf stack. OK? So I'm only a couple of clicks uh, that I can walk that map, that visualization. I get to a node and I click and up comes this beautiful perf stack view to give me an understanding of all the pertinent metrics for me figuring out what's really wrong. But would you argue this is also a map? I mean, it's, 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 it's time correlated histograms, mm -hmm. but it's based on the same discovery information that AppStack uses, that the mapping engine is using, and it is com it, like when you go out and expand and kind of walk through the browser here to then go and add elements that are a part of, mm -hmm. uh, that are part of a, a metric, 
this doesn't look like topology to me, but this looks like mapping, that the correlation is exposing itself here as a vertical stripe of a bunch of histograms, but it's still mapping. Uh, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's entity relationship. But I spent so much time crafting that. I know! Ugh. But it's entity relationship without a doubt, which is something our mapping has, essentially, right? We're drawing a map to give you uh, a node graph. That's typically what graph databases do right. well, nodes and edges. This is giving you those metrics. Uh, here are your nodes and edges right here, uh, but we're giving you, I would just say, a, I would say a graph more than the map, but I know what you're saying, and to me it's, you could make that argument that, yeah, this is just another version of the map. You could just say, you know what, it's the same data just displayed differently. And what's beautiful about that is this is going to speak to a certain segment of the IT population. There are people out there, you know what, I just need a spark line. Right. And then other people in IT, they want the nodes and the edges, and they want to be able to walk through and hover over and click through that way. We're giving different views of the same data so that it can be consumed by different people and groups inside of IT. So this tool has value throughout. And that's the interpretation of data that we've all had conversations about ourselves, that as long as you're able to understand it, that's the tool, that's the area of which that you may need, but I may need something else. So when you have one tool that's able to display that in different ways to show that visualization, I mean, that, that's what helps bring teams together, even though they're unique individuals. Or even if it's not a, a common tool, it's just the approach of using the tool in a common way, yeah. right? Because you can explain to anyone on the team, here's a way of navigating dynamic maps, and it's going to work the same regardless of the context. Yeah. Uh, now, as an aside, and, and we'll wrap up this section, uh, but I, as an aside, I do want to say this is this is an example. There's some criticism that you know SNMP is old and busted, and it just isn't good for anything. And that's not true. It's ubiquitous. It's been around forever, and it is in a lot of time, a lot of cases, especially for networking, the only the only thing you can use. But talking about graph databases, one of the things that's nice about this is when you're looking at virtualization mapping, we don't have to discern traffic. We don't have to uh, try to put node IDs together to figure out what the mapping is. There's a lot of math involved in those network maps. But here, you're going against the APIs for vCenter and for uh, yep. Hyper-V, and so it comes back as a nice data set. So one of those things that people always say, they say, oh, SolarWinds Orion is all SNMP. No, nope. we're a software company. We like APIs because the data that comes back is, is so much richer. So in this case, the only thing that they need to do to be able to get the data that's actually powering maps, uh, AppStack and PerStack here is what? Credentials for? vCenter. For vCenter in this case, yep. So I hope you don't mind me stepping on your toes a little bit there, because you, you <laughs> made mention that you couldn't find those relationships between those virtual servers. And, well, you were just wrong. I've been, that's okay. I've been schooled. I yeah, it's okay. So I, I will tell you, there is one thing I do absolutely need help with, and that is distributed applications. Ah, distributed applications and tracing. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay, well, let me show you a little something. We'll talk about it just for a couple of minutes, and then we'll, we'll wrap this thing cool. up. Cool. You want to drive? Sure. All right. Okay, not to beat a cloud horse to death, but... Distributed applications, a lot of you are telling us this is something that you're dealing with more now. And remember, that is basically, whether you call it monolithic application deconstruction into cloud native primitive services or whatever you want to call it, you're taking... It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It was a lot. I actually was able to say it. But there's, <laughs> there's a lot. It's basically taking what was a nice, big unfathomable thing and mm -hmm. breaking it into a lot of other unfathomable smaller things, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are from kind of the cloud world, if you've been working with them for a long time, you're probably using AppOptics, right? So AppOptics is designed to be able to do, you know, look at infrastructure in a slightly different way than we typically do with Orion platform, but definitely to do something which is application tracing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I don't really know how these things are connected. So what I'm going to do is inject IDs into the actual flow of transactions from the front end all the way to the back end services and back, and then figure out how they're connected, and then isolate areas where there's choke points or something else, right? Okay. So the views that I look at a lot of times, like here's a set of services, right? These are sort of at that infrastructure view, and, and you hear us talk about application performance monitoring, sort mm -hmm. of APM instead of uh, server and application monitor. This is kind of what we're talking about, is infrastructure plus tracing plus events plus a bunch of other things. So in this case, 
Here's, these are all metrics that I'm getting back from different services. And this is a service that it's like a hotel booking service, right? So right. I've got an administrator's panel, I've got an analyst services, I've got APIs that are maybe interacting with other uh, third parties, bookings, a bunch of other things. So I'm trying to figure out how these things are connected. Now again, we're, we're not in Orion here, this is inside of AppOptics. And if I go over here and take a look at the tracing view, this is an example of a single transaction. And I'll, I'll save the mm -hmm. trouble of drilling down to it. Basically, I would be on a service, I'd isolate a transaction, I'd go through the heat map, and I, we're going to show this actually in a session uh, at Thwack Camp. You'll want to check it out of, of how this actually works. But what we're looking at here is, you know, this is a single transaction. I can see the data for it. I can see all the layers. Like if we were looking at a regular application stack and a monolithic app, that's what these are. In this case, these are services that are that are that are connected. But just like we were talking about before, it's always hard, like figuring out how things are connected. And in the app stack view that, you, or the perf stack view that you had a minute ago, yeah. my argument that that's actually a map. Well, if I look across here. I mean, these are all like uh, transactions against databases, um, spring, this is the traffic that's running across my rails, my uh, number of, like each one of these little stripes here is a database query against a MongoDB. Mm. But the thing I want to call out here before I show you what this looks like and something that we're kind of experimenting with, you see how I've got all these boxes across here that represent each one of those layers? Yeah. Well, in the same way that when we were looking at that perf stack view, mm -hmm. this, these are maps. So if you think about it, that's a map of the components that actually represents all the transactions that are happening, all the dependent calls that actually make up this one single web transaction. Okay. So I would argue that this is actually a form of mapping because it's taking what is data that's coming from monitoring or, or at least receiving um, the uh, uh, traces that are actually running across and it's pulling them into this view. Now, again, this is AppOptics. This is a cloud service. It's, it's a SaaS product. It's running out in the cloud. But um, you've been asking for, uh, initially, for IIS and .NET-based applications to be able to do application tracing inside of the Orion platform. So something that we're experimenting with, and what you want to do is take a look, of course, always go out to uh, thwack.com, search for what are we working on, and there'll be details about kind of what we're thinking about you know, with this product, but definitely check that out. Um, but I'll give you a little preview here. So um, here's a here's a, a node that this is an IIS server, right? Mm -hmm. So I would get my regular views on this server, and I can see whether it's performing well or not. But I'd like to be able to include traces along with everything else, right? Because right. I'm going to see performance. I'm going to see traffic maps. I'm going to see all the things that we've been talking about before. And if I drill into the mapping over here on the left-hand side, I could look, go get it, look at its physical right. infrastructure, network, the rest of it. But I'd like to be able to also trace the distributed components of the application that are running on that IIS server. And so for that, this is what that looks like. And so um, over here on the side, you'll notice this little SolarWinds APM, Ooh. right? Now, this is, a, this is an add-on. This is, this, is, this is not built into SAM. Um, mm. And so what's happening here is this looks like the kinds of thing that I would normally see, right? I've got status codes. I've got response time. i got requests per second. Uh, I've got my methods that are actually being called. But these are actually coming out of data that's coming from AppOptics, coming from the Ooh. service in AppOptics to be able to do APM monitoring in addition to infrastructure monitoring. Okay. And so, the, so you can see here that I'm actually looking at an IIS application pool. So it's yep. sort of running at that IIS.NET level. And it's pulled it into that view. Configuring this is really, really easy. I'll save you the trouble of walking through here, but it's settings, all settings, and then integration, and then run through it. It'll take okay. you to this page, and then you click on Add, and then there's a uh, wizard that'll walk you through that will go through the process of installing the agent that it needs and actually connecting and getting the data integrated into the view. Awesome. So we're really interested in getting your feedback on this. Um, again, Take a look at what are we working on in Thwack. Um, there'll be, you know, we'll, we hope to get this into a release fairly soon. And this is something that it's the, there are a small number of customers that need this a lot right now. But every time we talk to you guys, whether it's the, whether it's the chat uh, around SolarWinds Lab or like at Cisco Live this year, it was amazing how many people, how many of you came by and said, hey, yeah, well, so we got this, this thing now where we're inheriting containers and mm. uh, we're starting to actually do a lot of microservices and distributed applications and how to, what does that look like? So this is the beginning of that. So we really want to know what you think about it. Well, I think it looks great, but any limitations for this? There are a couple limitations. Okay. Um, this is IIS and .NET only. Right. You don't get all the views that you get with TraceView, right? So right. if you are uh, cloud native, if you were doing a lot of distributed applications, then this is this is actually probably going to be more appropriate for you. And that you can imagine what it would be like to integrate all this into, okay. into Orion. And then the last thing is, 
I'll let you come back over here because you'll care about this. If you're a Fed customer, right, or you've got your air gapped for security for your network and you don't allow access out to the cloud, because this is based on the App Optics back in, which is a SaaS product, if it can't reach there, if it can't send metrics, if it can't send um, the right. trace data out to that endpoint, then this just won't work. Yeah. Hopefully you found this helpful. It is. And it's not a surprise how much we all rely on mapping regardless of what we are trying to fix in operations. That's really true. And when different teams can use solutions to visualize infrastructure regardless of sort of how it's connected, it's just a huge step up on troubleshooting and it means that it just saves you time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've all been there we, with those Visio diagrams that seem to be outdated the minute they even get published. So when you're tracking issues in your realm, having the ability to strategically visualize and then dive into and look for possible root causes to help you resolve issues even before they happen, well, that's practically magic. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and of course, if you have questions, we're here live, so just throw them into the chat box over here to the right, and if the chat box isn't there, it's because you're not with us live, so visit us at our homepage. That's lab.solarwinds.com. Get the schedule and set a reminder so you're with us live next time. Right, because we really want to hear from you guys. All right, well, that's all the time we have today. I'm Destiny Bertucci. I'm Thomas Laura. And I'm Patrick Hubbard, and thanks again for watching SolarWinds Lab. <laughs>